Oh, hallelujah, he's waiting on the hilltop. Oh, come on, let's go out and meet him. You'll never know what you can do until you learn to trust him. Come on up, he's waiting. Hallelujah, he's waiting on the hilltop.
<clears throat> I was just that first song Michael sang, My God's Real, and different things. Of course, Brother Smith and I have been doing, studying the Bible together, and it's really helped me a lot. Uh, but the last week, I had a, a friend that I had in school find me. Her brother found me. And uh, we talked, and uh, we hadn't seen her in over 50 years. I've been married 53 years. And so, um, and we talked, and we talked about life and childhood, and, and then I gave her my testimony. And uh, we... Uh, because uh, the people I grew up with know where, know how my family was and how dysfunctional my, my life was. So when they see Facebook and, and they talk to me, they want to know what happened. And then I give them my testimony. And then, um, then I, um, a cousin found us, uh, found my sister through uh, Ancestry.com. And well, she put in there, anyway, we found her that I used to have in uh, Hot Springs, and I haven't seen her since 1985 or six. I went down there at, uh, during a minister's meeting here and visited with the family. But um, we got to talking, and uh, I gave her my testimony. And she lives in Diamond now, and I don't know. Uh, she's supposed to come and visit. Uh, the church. She has the Holy Ghost. I don't know where that's going to go, but I thought I, I've i always been uh, open about the testimony uh, because I think maybe one day, one day, it'll touch somebody's life. And I was at Saturday. Uh, I was up early, and um, Brother Smith left to go to uh, the Republic meeting, and I thought, well, I'm before I get busy doing all the work, I'll feed the coons, and then I'll go to the dollar store. And so I did that, and I went to the dollar store, and it wasn't open yet. <clears throat> I, I turned around. There was a young man. He worked for a Coca-Cola company, and he was wanting to deliver the Cokes, but they weren't open yet. Anyway, and I said, I can't believe they're not open. He said, me neither. I've been here for an hour. So he'd been there since 6. I was there at 7. And I said, well, I said, I Anyway, I started talking to him. You know me, and my, I embarrass my husband a lot, me and Michael do. We talk to everybody about everything. Anyway, we got talking. He's 24 years old, and um, he's raised uh, Church of God in Christ. Anyway, but we talked about, I talked about, I talked about the 60s. I talked about things, uh, you know, I just talked about life. And then we talked about dogs, and then I showed him my dogs. And then he said, I used to be afraid of dogs. Anyway, we talked about all the natural things. And then I told him what my husband really did. And then I gave him my testimony. And he looked at me, and he smiled. He said, you lived 52 years longer than you asked for. I said, yes, I did. And you have five great-grandkids. Nice young man. I mean, nice young man. He's and I said, that's right. And that's, I said, our God is real. And he was a, I could tell he was a good young man. And I said, so uh, do you have any family here? He goes, not really. I forgot what little town they lived in, close to Arkansas, Little Rock. <clears throat> and so I asked him what his wife did and everything. And I said, look, I wish you'd consider coming and visiting our church. And I said, we're different, and not just because I'm white, it's different. <laughs> and I said, but I think you'd enjoy it. I think you would enjoy it. I said, we have a, a, we have a problem. I said, I just started talking to him. I said, it's so e much easier to go to your culture's church. It would be easier for me if I was in a, to do the same thing. But this church is not about culture. It's about God's people of all color coming together, learning the truth of God, 
and becoming one in the body. And he goes, where is that church? And I told him, he looked it up, he says, I know where it is. So y'all pray that this would be the time that I invited somebody that he actually walks through those doors. But I felt such a, we spent an hour together. And when I was leaving and he was through loading his, unloading his Cokes, he came over and he gave me a little hug. He had the sweetest spirit. His wife is an RN at Children's in the Infants Department in the, in the nursery. And he's been with Coca-Cola six years. He's a good man. He's got a baby. Y'all pray. Y'all pray that uh, God would touch him. I would really get excited. I have always witnessed to people and, and, and told them about the mercies of God and, and reached out to people. And I would like to see that, that someone come in. And, and Because we're not the only church. It, even Babylon's having trouble. But we have something to offer. And I would love to see that young man and his family come in here. And um, I just fell in love with him. He was just had a beautiful spirit. And then my cousin, she's had a hard life. She's 12 years younger than me, and she's not in very good health. And um, so I don't know if God's going to do anything there or not. And But... Um, all my friends that I've in contact with, that I grew up with, I've talked to them about the Lord, and a lot of them are Christians. But I would love to see something. You know, last year I was telling Sister uh, Chelsea, I said, last year, you know, we lost a lot of people last year, Brother and Sister Bud, and um, a lot of things happened last year. And I was outside praying, I said, God... I know you're capable of miracles, but are you in the miracle business anymore? Are you just letting us just reap what we sow? Are you going to, I would love to see a new, I'd love to see a miracle. Now, I don't believe that baby was born for me to see a miracle. <laughs> But that baby was born in a miracle needing position, and God let this church see a miracle. And I am so thankful for that. I am so thankful that, that he chose to reach down and show us his love and mercy for the Fisher family and for that baby. And we all got to see a miracle, a miracle right before our eyes. Does she still have Down syndrome? Yes, but she is a high-functioning, healthy baby, which we didn't think was going to make it a month. And I am so thankful. I am so thankful. I am so thankful what God has done. I know he's performing miracles, but there's other children that are sick, that they're not getting that miracle. And I said, God, thank you for the miracle. Thank you for that miracle that we have with Chelsea, with our little Mallory. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, I, I was really, really worried about that baby. I really didn't know if she's going to make it or not. And I'm sure they were felt the same way. But not only did he let her make it, she is making all the places where she's supposed to be as a baby. She's right there. That is a miracle. So I am excited. But I just love to witness for God. I, I'm not bashful about it. But I just like to see someone find what I found. How long has it been, Brother Smith? Forty-something years ago when we were discouraged and we found this way. I'd love to find somebody to find what we found and find uh, this people. I just want to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, 
appreciate the Lord today and these good songs and uh, Sister Smith's testimony. Um, I, I'm thankful today for this God that we're serving and, and uh, his, his touch in our lives. I, I was telling Sister Smith on the way to church this morning, I said, you know, this pandemic just feels like it's just about at its end. And just, I'm so thankful that we're, you know, getting back a little bit to normal. And uh, I was just thinking this morning, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to get our Wednesday night services started back up here before long. And, and uh, just feels good to, just to know that these uh, cases of of COVID-19 is just subsiding and that there's not, you know, near as much, uh, <clears throat> there's not near, there's not hardly any people being affected or dying by it now like they were before where you're just hearing about multiple people every day right here in our state dying with it, going to the hospital and on the vent and, and uh, you know, and now you just hear very few cases and it's just, it just, don't you just feel better about things? Just feel safer than what we felt. I'm thankful for to God for that. I, I do believe God was in it. I don't believe that things like that happen by, by chance. I mean, I do believe some things happen by chance, but not when it affects the whole world. <clears throat> and I've, I really, I, of course I believe that the church ought to be more aware of what is God doing? You know, not only aware, but at least questioning God as to, you know, where do we fit in this? I mean, God didn't exempt the church from this. The whole world's been affected by it. And of course, I feel like that we are nearing the end, uh, last dispensation of the Gentile world. I know there's a millennial reign to take place after God harvests this world, but which is a lot of things has to take place yet. But uh, this pandemic, I have to consider that you know God's talking to us. I, anything like if you read the Bible, you'll see where God used plagues, famines, different judgments that not only affected the world, but Primarily, God was affecting the Jewish people in the Old Covenant. Uh, he was trying, you know, and like my wife said, we, we read, we've been studying the Bible together and reading our Bible together, and um, it's, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how that the people, you know, they would serve God for a while, and God would bless them, and they would be... Uh, you know, they'd feel so good about God's blessings that they'd wind up getting exalted and then they'd begin to turn away from God and let the world begin to come into their lives and they'd begin to worship idols and do all kinds of things and, and then God would judge them again. You know, God, <clears throat> it's amazing how God put the Jewish people he prophesied to Isaac, I mean to uh, Abraham that he was going to put them in bondage for 430 years. Well, it was just, uh, it was just, you know, uh, there were just a small group of people. 70 people went into Egypt when, when God sent Joseph into Egypt for the very purpose of bringing his whole family into Egypt. You know, he raised Joseph up to be the king's right hand and, and Joseph literally ruled Egypt for several years and God used him and, and brought all of his family there, 70 souls. But after a period of time, God did this. God prophesied it was going to happen. He, he caused a new Pharaoh to come in. A Pharaoh come in that didn't really have any uh, first-hand knowledge of, of Joseph. I mean, there's no doubt that he knew about it, 
but he didn't have any feelings that tied him to the Jewish people. He wound up putting the Jews under slavery. That lasted for 430 years. Now you think about that. Here's here's the people of God. And God sends them to a land. He blesses them. Puts them down in the land of Goshen. And they're blessed of God for a period of time. And then God puts them under slavery. Well, you have to understand God. You're you're talking about 70 souls. But at the end of that 430 years, there was over 3 million of them that had developed. In fact, it got so bad that the Pharaoh said, we got to do something about these Jews. They're, 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 they're like cockroaches. They're popping out everywhere. And so he, he, he made a law, kill every baby boy of the Jews. And y'all know the story, how Moses, his mother, she put him in a little bulrush. She made a little, she made a little, like a little boat for him that float on water and she hid him in the bulrushes because she didn't want him to kill him. Of course, it was the hand of God that sent Pharaoh's daughter there and she heard that baby cry in the bulrushes. And she sent her servant to get that baby. She said, that's one of them Hebrew babies. But she had compassion and wanted it for herself. (laughs) God something because... He said, go find a womb. Go find one of them Jewish women that's had a baby, that has milk, that could take care of this baby for me. And wouldn't you know that she found Moses' mama to do that job? My, my, God's so good. Uh, and, he, and I know you're thinking, I mean, you know, one would think, Why would God put these people under slavery for that length of time? Well, they were, God wanted to raise them up as a nation. So he put them in a place, but he kept them humble in slavery. He kept them in a humble condition where they would, when God got ready to free them from there and and develop them as a nation, he had them in a place where they had a need for God. If they would have... If they had just been blessed, they'd never wanted to leave Egypt. They'd have never wanted to escape from slavery. But God put them in a place where they had to remain in slavery. God's done that to nations before. And and God's caused them uh, uh, to be in slavery, to keep them humble, that he could save them. God's done that right here in America. God's, God's had slavery right here in America that he did it to save people. He brought them out of slavery, brought them here, let them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and begin to sing the old songs and hear, feel the spirit of God. God did that to save them. And then he began, and then he done away with slavery after a period of time. God works in ways that are past finding out almost. The Bible tells us, I mean, you have to be linked to God to find out some things that God did. But here God let the Jews develop in Egypt and then he freed them and brought them across uh, the desert and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years learning the things of God. That's where God taught them gave them the law of Moses, gave them the Ten Commandments. And they began to learn the the commandments of God down through that 40 years. God was, uh, there's a scripture in, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 8. You might be able to bring it up for me where he said, let me look right quick, see if I can find it. I'm still trying to learn how to use my iPad for my Bible. And... uh, I'm wanting the part where it said that he he did what he did to him to prove him. Is it in verse 1? 
Okay, uh, Deuteronomy 8, 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. If you remember, God, God prophesied not only to Abraham that he was going to put him in bondage for 130 years, but that he was going to give them, he's going to bless them and give them a promised land. Well, of course, a lot of them went to the grave expecting it and, and believing that it was going to happen. And it did happen, but it took God time to accomplish what his purpose was. It's one of the things that we have to understand about God dealing with our lives. Sometimes we don't know what his purpose is. That's why you have to trust him. <clears throat> you know, that, that, that song we've sung many years now, Learning to Lean. Learning to lean. Learning to lean on Jesus. To, to, to learn and to be able to trust Him and know that I'm His child and that He is working in my life and He has a purpose and if I'll trust Him, He'll bring, he'll bring His purpose to pass. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, Sometimes it's hard waiting on God, leaning on God, trying to figure out what is God doing. I remember when uh, Sister Smith and I went through what we went through uh, when we were just young. When we went through that, we had a very difficult time trying to figure out what God was doing in our lives. I mean, sometimes you, it's dark. Sometimes you can't see what God's doing in your lives. And you just have to trust Him. You just have to believe that He knows what He's doing. I know that I'm not, I know that I'm not just reminiscing what Sister Smith and I went through. I know every one of you have went through things, dark places, in the night. Uh, what, what, what did this... What did the Shulamite say in the Songs of Solomon? She said, um, I went through the city. Uh, I lay on my bed at night and I sought him whom my soul loveth. Every one of us has been in dark places. We've sought God. We've sought the one we, we love because we know that he touched our lives. But we, we can't start out knowing him well enough to understand his ways until we've served him for a while and until we've learned to lean on him and learned to trust in him. Blessed are they that trust in the Lord, the psalmist said. To, you know, and it, it just, it, you, you, you can trust him somewhat, but it just takes serving him longer, a longer period of time to know how to trust him. To to uh, where, where you, you develop a trust. You develop faith as you grow in God. You develop a hope, a trust, where you, you begin to know, I can trust Him. Now that's what I look for and when we're reading the Bible and studying. I'm looking for those people that have stuck it out that have endured unto the end. Paul said the same shall be saved. Those that stick it out and just keep trusting God, just keep relying on Him, just keep waiting for God to give an answer. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes God takes us through things that it, it tests our trust. I think sometimes God says, I want to see, I want to see if you'll make it. I want to see. I want to see how much of this you've got. How much can you trust me? Like when Ruth, when when Naomi told uh, Brother Dave's mentioned this yesterday in Republic. When Naomi told Ruth and Orpah, I said, "Go on back. I can't do much for you. I'm too old to have your children. You'd be too old one time they grow up to be your husbands. Why don't you go on back to where you came from?" Well. Uh, you, you know, 
I think that's, there's a picture in that. I mean, how many times you thought about going back where you came from? Especially in the beginning of your serving God. How, how much did you think about, you know, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and you, you'd come to the point of almost giving up. Brother Parker was talking about yesterday. He, he said, I'm about ready. He, was, he got to a place he was ready to hold up the white flag, surrender, you know. Well, I was glad to hear him be that honest about it because every preacher thought about giving it up, quitting somewhere. Because you go through dark places. God takes you through. No doubt, you know, there was Orpah and Ruth. There's a picture there. One of those girls, one of those girls got enough influence from Elimelech's two sons, McLean and Kilion. They got enough influence there was enough imparted to them that caused them to know that the Jewish people had something that the Gentile people didn't have. Orpah, she gave up when she said, why don't you go back? And I think God that does that to every one of us. When we come to the body of Christ, I think, I think God every once in a while says, I want to see how much of this you're getting. And, and God lets you be tested. You'll hear things like, and, and I, I went through this, when I came to this body, I felt like none of y'all cared whether or not I stayed or not. I got in that place. I felt like ain't nobody here cares if I stay or not. In fact, I heard a man tell one time, you know, I was driving a red Cadillac. What it was, it was a beat up old Cadillac that wouldn't hardly run right. And it's the only thing that I had... <laughs> I'd lost everything else I had. There wasn't, you know, before I came to the body, I, I was, go, I was, you know, I was doing pretty good. And uh, but when God, God had to humble me some, so I had to go through a humbling. And so I heard a guy say one time. He said that guy in his red Cadillac, he'll never stay in this. He'll never stay with this. But he can gather people, so let's get the people he gathers and then let him go. Well, that, that didn't set with me real good. But let me tell you something. Something had I had heard some other words that influenced me from the things of God that let me know there's a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven, and I'm hearing truths that I've never heard before. And I, I've, I've sought, I've longed for them. I was like uh, the Shulamite that said, I laid on my bed at night and I sought him whom my soul loveth. And I got up and I went into the cities and I looked for him whom my soul loveth. And, and I, I found, who was it she found? And, uh, and asked the watchman, yeah, you know, I've asked a lot of watchmen. Since I come to serve God, I've asked a lot of watchmen. Have you seen him whom my soul loveth? In other words, please tell me about Jesus. Please help me to understand the way of God, not just uh, maybe so or hope so or uh, very, uh, uh, what's the word I'm wanting, that a very shallow message about God. I want to know the truth about God. Let me know a greater truth about Him. Help me to get saddled in the things of God and that will help me to serve Him and, and have His righteousness working in my life where I'll do the things that pleases Him. And I saw Him. The Shulamite said, I asked the watchman, have you saw Him whom my soul loveth? And... And it said, and I went a little past them. <laughs> Sometimes you have to go beyond. You, you, can't, you can't always be settled with, because not everyone has found what God is really working on. And, and she went a little past him whom her soul loveth and found him who her soul loveth. I can relate to that because I, I got to a place where I was, I was just not satisfied. I just wasn't satisfied. I knew there was more of God. 
and I wanted it. I wanted to find him. I wanted to know more about him. I wanted to understand it better. And I just kept searching. I had a pastor one time, I, I was talking to him, and I know I was talking to him about my confusion, that I wanted to know more about God. One time I was at the altar praying, my, my pastor put his hands on his head, my head. He said, God touched this boy's brain. He said, he's so confused. <laughs> I wasn't confused. I was searching for God. I was searching for more of him. I wanted to know. I wanted to be closer to him. I wanted to know him in a greater way. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, uh, I, Brother Ayers, one time, you know, Brother Ayers, I, I influenced Brother Ayers, and he was coming in, coming around and receiving things, and we were in his church service one time, and the preacher was preaching. He said, I wish somebody would just jump out of their seat and start running. Brother Ayers just jumped up and took off. That scared that preacher to death. Now they'll say things like that, but they don't want you to have the freedom to really just do what you feel to do in God and have that liberty to worship him. <laughs> I was watching these little kids this morning. I remember the first time Sister Smith and I went to... Uh, what was his name? Brother Keller's church in, in Fort Worth. Brother Keller was there and Brother Clyde and Brother Don Patton was there in, in Brother Keller's church. They were all three there. And uh, <clears throat> But Sister Smith and I had uh, one of her school friends. I don't know how she underst I don't know how she remembers all them school friends. I, I can't come up with one name of anybody I graduated with. Not one. It didn't stick with me. You know, I mean, but she's that way. Like she was telling you, like this guy, this Coca-Cola salesman, you know, I mean, he, he just shouldn't have been there if he didn't want to get involved in a big conversation. Because, I mean, I can meet somebody and walk away and I don't know their name. I don't know where they live. I don't know where they come from. I don't know nothing about them. We just had a little conversation. Sister Smith can meet somebody in a grocery store and we come out of there and she knows who they're married to, how long they've been married, what town they come from, what school they graduated from, who their aunts and uncles are and who just died in their family and what's going on. And I'm thinking, you got all that in that five minute talk you had with that person? She, she, she. She just does that. It's just the way she is. She's a, she's a true sanguine. You know, that's what a sanguine does. A sanguine is the life of every party. They, they know everything about you. I mean, they, they, they will, it, when a sanguine, sanguine person, I'm talking about, you know, the, the four uh, temperaments of people. Sanguines, phlegmatics, uh, cholerics, and... Uh, Melancholies. And, and uh, I'm glad you found out, Brother Phil, that your wife's choleric. I'm glad you found that out. It'll help you, It'll help you with your relationship. Uh, because if you don't understand a person, you won't understand what makes them like they are. You know, Sister Smith and I, she, she's an amazing person. Uh, we, the other day, we got in the car and we, 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 we drove about 30 or 40 minutes. And I'm telling you, there wasn't 10 seconds went by that she wasn't talking the whole time we was driving. And uh, I finally told her, I said, honey, relax. I said, just relax. She said, I'm, I, I'm relaxed. I said, no, you're not relaxed. I said, your, your mind's going 100 miles an hour. You, you, ain't, you ain't hushed in 30 minutes. You're just going on and on and on. Talking, talking, talking. I said, I can't keep up with all what you're saying. It's, I, it's too confusing for me to keep up. Sometimes I say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who are you talking about? You know, sometimes she switches uh, conversations in the middle of the stream. It's, it's going on in her head, but I didn't catch it. You know, so sometimes I have to figure out what is she talking about? Or who is she talking about? When did this happen? I don't know if we're talking about last year or 40 years ago. You know, sometimes I'll get in the middle of the conversation. 
And uh, so we got this deal now. I've got, I got it working with her, you know. She gets to talk. And quiet. I'll say, honey, relax. And she says, oh. So she'll be quiet for about 10 more seconds. And so, but, but really, I mean, it's phenomenal that she's, she's, she has all going on in her mind. Sometimes I catch her talking to herself. I said, who are you talking to? She said, I'm talking to myself because I'm the only one that pays any attention to me. <laughs> well, I've tried it a few times. It don't work for me like that. I don't even pay attention to myself that much. Anyway, let me get off of my wife. Um, but, uh, but, you know, God, uh, this, I, I was mentioning how Ruth, you know, she, uh, Naomi, you know, when she told her and her sister, go back where you came from. I know that that's a test sometimes God puts us through. When God, God, you know, we, we, we get in a place where we just, we don't, we, we're not influenced enough, maybe, of the things of God that causes us to desire. Look what Ruth desired of Naomi. By the way, this little book of Ruth is talking about, it is a picture in the Bible of the New Testament church in restoration down here in the end of this world. God wrote it over 3,000 years ago for our very benefit. And <clears throat> But there was something about what Ruth saw. See, she was a Gentile and there was a famine just kind of get this picture in your mind. Elimelech and Naomi left Israel because there was a famine. They went to try to go somewhere and survive. That's a picture of the early church falling away and there was a, a spiritual famine among the Gentiles. And that early church, that's what Elimelech, Naomi, and her two sons represented is that early, those that got what the early church had and in the Gentile world. And that, that represents those down here that are in the restoration that gets what that early church had. And then those that come in like Moa, like, like uh, Ruth and Orpah. And then Naomi heard that God was visiting the land. That, that's, the re, that's a picture of the restoration of the church down here in the end of the Jewish world. And there's people that's going to be influenced by this restoration to the point that they're going to be like Ruth and say, when, when, they're, when, when, it, when there seems like somebody saying, go back to where you came from, but there's going to be something in your heart that touched you like Ruth was touched. Her sister went back to Moab. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor from following thee. She said, Because where you go, I'm going to go. That's how, when you find the people of God, and God really touches you, You'll give up everything. You'll give up everything. Remember what Jesus said when he said, Who, whosoever gives up houses or lands, mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters, for my sake, will I give a hundredfold more in this life plus everlasting life. My family, a big part of my family left me when I came to God because they, they didn't want to come to God. They wanted to live in the world. So they didn't want to have much to do with me. But God give me a hundredfold in this life. Look at my brothers and sisters. I got more in common with you and I've got my own natural family. I'm not against my family. I love my family. But I've got more in common with the people of God than I do my natural family. And it's not just this church, but it's churches all over, the body of Christ in the United States. I, yesterday, Brother Mark was telling me, he said, I feel so good that I went yesterday because 
I got so encouraged being around the people of God and hearing God's people and different ones rejoicing in the things of God. It was just such a good fellowship together. <clears throat> you know, you, you, you can just gather you can just gather a number of God's people together and you just, you just have a good you just have a good service. We just know God just helped us to know how to how to entreat the Lord. Anyway, I'm thankful today to that God has uh, has influenced. I mean, I look at the little book of Ruth like that. That I was influenced. She said, "Where you go, that's where I'm going." Your people are going to be my people. She didn't have a clue. She didn't have a clue where Naomi was going to take her. She had never been to Israel. But I'm going to go with you. That's why I feel when I found the people of God. I thought, I don't care where y'all take me, I'm going with you. Because I feel like I found my mama. I feel like I found my Savior. And I've got confidence. And she said, your people are going to be my people. And your God is going to be my God. And where you die, that's where I'm going to die. I mean, that's confidence, isn't it? I'm willing, I'm willing to die because I've got hope in a resurrection because I believe you people know where it's at. I, I, I'm going to be a part of God's people. And, and I'm going to be a part of their, of their land, their, what God's doing among them. And y'all know the story. You read the little book of Ruth. It was during the famine was over. That's a picture of the famine. We've come through a famine in the Gentile world. This Gentile world's come through a famine fi- trying to find God in his fullness. When the church is fully restored, Naomi heard that God had visited the land. And so she was headed back to Israel. That's a picture of us seeing God is restoring and we've got to go back to what the early church had. And and, and, and you know what time it was? It was reaping time. They were reaping a harvest. There's a harvest coming, saints of God. Jesus isn't going to come just like that, but he is, there's a harvest coming where God is going to begin to bless his people just like he blessed the early church. Sister Smith was talking about miracles. But let me tell you why there are so many miracles in the, when Jesus was on the earth and then after the day of Pentecost why there were so many miracles. Those miracles were signs that would draw people. That, that's evangelistic. God did that to, to show himself to that world and to draw people to him and realize what that song we were singing said today, my God is real. He, he convinced people that there's a real God in heaven. Let me tell you something. God is not interested in just doing miracles and being a cosmic Santa Claus to do what anybody wants him to do. That's not what God's about. God's about developing righteousness. Let me tell you something. You can go to heaven with, with, with blinded eyes. You can go to heaven with, with, you can lose a leg and go to heaven. You can't go to heaven without knowing God. You, you, you what's natural is only temporary. But what's What's eternal is what God does in your soul, what God does in your heart, and how he develops his righteousness in you. And I'm not, look, hey, I'm not talking, I'm not against miracles and healings. I believe in them. I've seen them. I've watched a few in my life. And I know there's more to come than there ever has been in the Gentile world. When God gets ready to harvest this world, he will use Miracles and signs and demonstrations of the Spirit to woo people and to prove to them that there's a real God in heaven. But what he's really interested in 
is that you come by the wooing and then you receive the truth of the Word of God and that you grow from a baby to a full stature of Christ. Yes, that you grow to the fullness of Christ. And uh, <clears throat> put that scripture up there in, in uh, Ephesians, um, the fourth chapter. give it to you here I'm the, the exact verse Let's start starting verse 11 Ephesians 4 and 11 <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to wind this up and he gave some apostles and some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers why for the perfecting of the saints See, that word perfecting means maturing. For the work of the ministry, that's why he gave those, those ministers, for the edifying of the body of Christ, to promote it, till we all come in the unity of the faith. The unity. Not that everybody believes different, but that finally everybody receives enough and understands God's truth. That will come fully in the restored church and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or a mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You think that's happening in the world today? Oh yes, it's happening in the world today. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. <clears throat> you know, that's what God's trying to do. He's trying to get us like that early church where we're fitted together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Brother McGowan and I were talking before service here today about how if God can put men together to work together where they're really working together in the same purpose we're going to accomplish more than we've ever accomplished before once God gets us together in unity and that we're working for the same thing I'm not building something over here and somebody's building something else over there even right here in this church we gotta get, we've got to get in unity in what we're building to accomplish. And it can't be of man or my idea or your idea, but it has to be of God. God's got to bring us into that uni unity, and he's working on it. We're just having to lean on him until he gets it accomplished. I was talking about how God put the Israel together under slavery for 430 years and to humble them did I ever read that in Deuteronomy 8? I didn't finish it, but it said he did that to humble them and to prove them. He kept them in a 40-year wilderness to get them in a place that he could give them the land of promise and that they could uh, accomplish what he wanted them to accomplish. And he made a nation out of them. That's why he took them through all of that. That they became a great nation that manifested God to the world back there. Of course, they failed God. Like I said, that, you know, there, there were great kings like, like David, Solomon. After Solomon, the kingdom split. There was a division. There was problems. God finally had to put them back in, uh, uh, under Assyria for a time and then he had to put them under Babylon for 70 years captivity until he humbled them again and got them ready. You know, God's had to do a lot of things in the United States of America. You, this nation is the nation that God has chosen to restore his church in and he's done more in the United States of America than in any other nation in the Gentile world. He's blessed America with the word of God 
but this nation's turned its back on God. Our leaders are no more God-fearing men. I mean, there's a few in there. Thank God for that. But for the most part, for the most part, our leaders in government are wicked people. They don't care. They don't care about God. But God still, His hand is on this nation and He'll finish the work that He's called this nation to do through the church. It's the same picture that you see in Israel. You look at the end of the world, in the Jewish world. When Jesus came to that world, the Jews didn't even accept Him. The Rome was against the church. It was against the body of Christ. The Jews put in with Rome. They were against. In fact, they used Pilate to kill Jesus. They didn't see what God was doing. But there was a type of that little Ruth that even you could use it as a type back there of how, how God had a people that were influenced by Jesus Christ and those 12 apostles and the ministry that God developed out of all that in that harvest in the end of that world that turned that world upside down and turned every rock over, found every person that could receive Jesus Christ and and enter into the work of God, His eternal purpose of having a, a people that could live above sin throughout eternity. Mm, I want to be a part of that. Down, I want to be a part of that kind of church down here. That I can live for God in such a way that He could, he could give me eternal life and I'd never mess it up. You know, I'm just going to tell you, saints, if God took every one of us to heaven just in this class right here today, Somebody said hell would break out in glory before tomorrow morning. Because everybody in here don't have the right spirit. And and you think God's just going to change you? You wouldn't be you if God changed you. The mind you've got is who you are. And, And here's the dressing room down here. This is where the bride, this is where she makes herself ready and puts on a white linen garment. This is where God is taking us through whatever he takes us through to make us righteous. You, you, you might say like the, the, the Thessalonians said to him, what if we die? What if we die before that happens? He said, well, let me just tell you about that. He said, if you die before it happens, when he comes back again, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and you're going to be able, you're going to, be able to see it and you're going to be able to finish your course God, death don't hinder God. Death, death doesn't hinder God. That's why there's a resurrection of the dead. There was a re- there's been resurrections of the dead even down through the old covenant just to show that God can raise the dead. But, but there's, there's going to be, there's gonna be a, a big resurrection. There's a resurrection in the early church. There'll be a resurrection down here. There'll be a resurrection after the thousand years. And the the world's got that all fouled up. They think God's resurrecting people to kill them again. And God ain't interested in that. You know, I I, I used to, I I remember, I used to be scared. This guy had a record one time. I listened to it, I put it on, and it was about the judgment seat of God. You know, I used to think this way. I used to think, whenever you die, you're going to go before the judgment seat. And, of course, my name starts with an S. And so I, I figured, you know, all them A, B, C's, and D's, they're, they're, they're going ahead of me. I'll just well go to the end of the line. That's what I did in school. I just, you know, my name's Smith, S. I just go to the end. Sister Zamora, I guess you'd go plumb to the end. So, <clears throat> but, but, you know, now I had this in my mind that you'd go up before the judgment seat. That's not how that's going to happen. The fact of being the judgment, there's a judgment that's already started in our lives. God, He in the, in the end of the Jewish world, that church back there judged, the judgment seat of Christ was set up, and when you came into that church, judgment started. 
Here's how God's judgment starts. When you come in, you get information. And then God watches what you do with your information. And then, after God gets you enough information, He wants you to respond to it. It's like going to school. You, you get information about God's righteousness, what He expects out of you, and He expects you to start doing it. That's what uh, somebody said yesterday, what Brother Leninger used to say was, it's simple how to get saved. Here's how you do it. You quit doing the things that you ain't supposed to do. And you start doing the things that you're supposed to do. Period. You ever hear him say period? With his finger pointed out? Period! It's just that simple. There's a period behind that statement. <laughs> well, it sounds easy, don't it? But it's not that easy. It's not even easy all the time to figure out what's right and what's wrong to do. Sometimes, you know, you're, you're, sometimes it's right here and wrongs here and they're very, the line is very close what pleases God and so <clears throat> this is a journey saints was that old song I used to sing I won't, I won't take nothing from my journey now <laughs> well we're on a journey God's taking us through a process to save us and we have to be faithful this is he that endureth to the end of the same shall be saved praise God well, I could go on and talk about this for a while longer, but if you didn't get the gist of it, we'll come back and I'll say more about it later. But we need to stop and take up prayer requests and, and receive the tithes and offerings. Um, what I want you all to know, yesterday morning, right before the fellowship meeting in Republic, Brother Jimmy Dickens' daughter, Sister uh, Sonia, they thought she had a major stroke. They heard an ambulance out there because she lives right down the road from the church. And they, they heard an ambulance, but they didn't have any idea. It was Brother Dickens' daughter. They thought she had a major stroke, but after they got her to the hospital, they found that she had a, a, a critical tear above her aorta and above her heart. And they had to call in a, a specialist they was able to keep her alive until the specialist got there and they did surgery on her for several hours. In fact, they were still operating on her when the meeting was over yesterday. I talked to Sister Janice Dickens, Brother Dickens' wife, my cousin, uh, and, and she said this morning, she wrote me and said she made it through the surgery and they said three hours after the surgery is the most critical part. She made it through that and she's doing fairly well through the night, but they still asking us to pray for her because it was really a critical surgery and a critical place for her to have a, a artery to tear. So pray for her. Sister Janice is 78 years old, I believe now, and she has cancer, but it's in the beginning stages, and the doctor feels like she's going to have surgery. Is it the 25th of this month? And... The doctor said, I don't even think you'll have to have chemo or radiation. We think we, 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 it's, it's located. We think we can get it all. and We don't think it's the kind of cancer that's going to require that. But she asked us to keep praying for her. So remember that. Uh, Brother Daniels, I requested prayer for you yesterday, Brother Daniels, because I'm planning on you to come up. You know, Brother Daniels, I'm looking at him like that guy that's seen a hat floating down the river. And he went out there to get that hat and he picked the hat up and the head looked up at him. He said, put my hat back on my head. I'm on a good horse and I'm coming up out of here. <laughs> That's the way I'm looking for you, Brother Daniels. I'm look, I think there's a head under the hat that's floating. <laughs> Keep praying. I need Brother Daniels. Don't, don't we need him? Keep praying for him. God, I think God can heal him completely. I'm looking for Brother Daniels to to get over what's ailing him. Yeah, another miracle. We may just see the beginning of miracles start around here. God, I'm, let me tell you something. We get a few miracles in here, we fill up a bunch of these empty seats. 
we've got several people gone today, and I noticed our band, I counted six people missing out of the band today. I don't like that. That's not good. I don't, I don't feel good to me. I look around and see people, you know, gone. Somebody told me that somebody called them and said, tell Brother Smith that I didn't get everything I wanted to do yesterday, and so I just stayed home today from church so I could get it done. I said, tell that person I don't like to hear them kind of messages. I don't think there's anything more important than coming to the house of God. I don't think we ought to put off the things of spiritual for the things of natural. Not unless it's, you know, I know there's exceptions to every rule. But I think the main rule ought to be that I'm going to be in the house of God when the people gather together because I'm afraid I'm going to miss something if I don't. I heard Brother Gene Sugg preach. Uh, tell, tell behind the pulpit one time in Fort Worth. He said, I've been in this church a long time. He said, you know what I've noticed? He said, I've noticed in the services that the unfaithful don't show up. That's when we get the most. He said, I've seen God do that over the years to give the faithful something extra because of their faithfulness. He said, I've just watched that. He said, so if there's anybody out there that's not faithful, you might want to consider. <laughs> well, I wasn't unfaithful, but I liked what he said. It made me feel like I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to be a part of the faithful. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, what else we need to pray for today, brother? Uh, DJ. All right, invite him to church. You have, good. Sister Jerry? Wow. All right, let's remember that prayer request. Sister Amber? Yes. Yes, I think probably everyone here knows Sister Julie Crafton. Of course, her and her husband are two of the people that wasn't in the band today, and that's understandable. She had a stroke this week. Uh, she's home now. She's doing. She's going to do outpatient therapy, and she's getting most of her <coughs> movement back. She wrote me yesterday morning and said, uh, you know, I had a therapist that even helped me to get my left arm up above my head, which she hadn't been able to hardly move it. Uh, what I heard and so that was encouraging then she said in her text I'm planning on being at church tomorrow morning and I thought well you thinking you're, you know I, I thought I think you're pushing it a little bit Sister Julie and of course she didn't make it this morning and I didn't expect her to but let's pray for Sister Crafton because this was a serious stroke and I'm so thankful that it you know that it didn't cripple her uh and, and really hurt her much worse than what it has. Let's pray that God gives her all of her faculty, I mean, you know, all of her movement back in her body and helps her. It's, it's, you know, she needs God's help right now. Let's keep them in God's prayers. What else? Sister Atkins? You're going out of town? California. Okay. Brand new baby. Well, that's a reason that grandmas have to go out of town. You know. All right. Sister Claire. She's coming home tomorrow, so remember her. He's still at Sister Holly's. Pray for Sister Holly too. This hasn't been easy on Sister Holly. I, when I when I when she offered to help them, I I told her they might. I thought they'd be there about two weeks. They'd been there almost two months, and it's, it ain't easy. And especially as sick as Brother Ray is, and and all the what they're going going through. Uh, pray that we can help get their house uh, ready for them to get back in it. I, I'm hoping I can get that done within the next two weeks. I've got campground next weekend, so. This is not, you know, it's not easy. 
but hopefully maybe we can get the sheetrock put up this week and see where we go with it. But anyway, keep praying for Brother Weaver, Brother Ray and Sister Susan. Uh, he he isn't he's not doing well at all. He stays in the bed most of the time, and, and when he's not in the bed, he can't hardly get around. So he's been back in the hospital. Susan's been in the hospital, and they're just not doing that well. So remember them, please. Uh, Sister Cindy, I sure miss Cindy. You know, I like it, I like Brother Michael's leading us in song service. He's doing a good job, but I just miss her. I miss her saxophone. I miss her. I miss everything about her. I don't like it. You know, but but her mom's you know not doing well, and she's having to take care of her mom, and so Michael's uh, trying to fulfill his job and hers too. So pray for them. Pray for Sister Angie Elder, Sister. Uh, uh, who? Yeah, she had ver. Yeah, she talked to me. She had vertigo yesterday. And uh, but I think she's better today. I don't think she's pretty well over. But she woke up with vertigo yesterday and wasn't doing too good. Sister Donna, we're going to mention. Yeah, I, she. I think she is better today. Uh, all right, let's let's stand. Un, uh, unspoken request. Yes, let's all stand and ask God. If the ushers have come, we'll receive your tithes and offerings and. And uh, close service, but so uh, let's ask God to help us meet these needs. Oh God, Jesus touched Sister Sonia, there, Brother Dickens' his daughter, and this critical surgery she's underwent. God use this for Your glory. God, oh God, touch Sister Janice and this condition in her body. Brother Daniels, God, we're asking you to. Uh, heal him, touch him, raise him up from this condition that he's uh, that's hindering his body today. Brother Ray and Sister Susan Weaver, these, these requests that were mentioned here today, Sister Angie Elder, Sister Holly, oh God, we're asking you, Lord, to help us. Uh, Sister Julie Crafton, God, restore her body God, in the use of her left arm and her body and functions. Oh, Lord, God, help us. Help us, oh, God, to do your will in a greater way. Touch our people. Oh, God, lead us and guide us and help us, Lord. To let your will work in our lives. We love you and we're thankful for your goodness to us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Praise God, praise God. All right. God bless you as you give today. These ushers will serve you and receive your tithes and offerings. I might mention to you we didn't have church last week, so we didn't have we didn't have tithes and offerings. And the week before that was probably the lowest uh, uh, giving that we had had in a long time. So uh, let God talk to your heart. Thank you for your giving. In God's name. Amen. All right. God's building a church in this hour. For oh, the righteousness of power. He'll have a ladder rain for all the world to see. It will
Um, remember, this next weekend is the, oh, well, it's not this next weekend. It starts a week from tomorrow night, Monday, the campground meeting in Louisville, Kentucky, or Shepherdsville. And um, so pray for the camp meeting, the minister's meeting at the camp meeting. And uh, then I will, I'll have the broadcast Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So I'll see you on Facebook. God bless your hearts. Shake hands and be friendly. I think you can probably shake hands.